In this video, you will learn the 2023 guidelines for rehabbing patients after an ACL reconstruction. Check out our online courses now. The link is in the video description. Hi, and welcome back to PhysioTutors. Aspatar published this open access paper to provide clinicians with clinically meaningful guidelines for rehab. Before we start off, I would like to stress that almost all recommendations are based on very low certainty evidence, so do not take it to the bank. We start off with preoperative rehabilitation. Is it useful? It could improve quadricep strength, knee range of motion, and decrease the time to return to sport. The guideline group recommends at least one visit preoperatively for three reasons. One is to check for flexion contractures, two is for quadriceps voluntary muscle contraction, and three is for education around the post-op rehab. Now, off to the post-op rehab. Should it be supervised? Well, it depends. You might want to consider unsupervised execution if your patient cannot afford supervised, has a reduced access to a physiotherapy clinic, or is highly motivated and compliant. In any case, the program should be monitored and tailored to the individual. Let's go over a few passive modalities, such as passive motion, NMES, and dry needling. Continuous passive motion is often used in the first post-op phase. However, the research group recommends against it due to the time-consuming nature and the lack of evidence in terms of pain, range of motion, and swelling. Ice, however, can be used for pain control. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation is often a controversial topic. It is regarded as a passive and ineffective modality. But in the early phase, it might be used to minimize disuse atrophy. It might even be combined with functional activities for increased strength gains. For dry needling, there was one study that examined the effects of vastus medialis trigger point dry needling. The guideline group recommends against the use of dry needling due to the increased risk of hemorrhage. Blood flow restriction is an intervention that gained a lot of popularity over the last few years. The modality might be used as an adjunct to the early phase if patients are unable to sustain high knee joint loads. Whole body vibration is not recommended due to the additional costs and reported complications such as pain and swelling. Now let's dive into the exercise recommendations. Active knee motion should be started right after surgery. Immobilizing the leg does not help for pain control and only induces knee atrophy. Weight bearing should begin in the first week in a progressive and controlled manner unless the surgeon instructs otherwise. It's advised to use isometric quadriceps exercises in the first two weeks after surgery. This will not risk the graft integrity. Leg presses can be started after three weeks in a half squat motion. Eccentric quadriceps training with a stepper or eccentric cycle in 20 to 60 degrees of knee flexion can be started after three weeks as well. Aquatic therapy is something to add after three to four weeks if the wound is completely healed. Open chain exercises can start as early as week four in a 90 to 45 degree flexion limit. Make sure to monitor anterior knee pain with these exercises and tailor accordingly. For strength and motor control, a few recommendations were made. The recurring theme appears to be that combining is better than a standalone. This is true for combining close and open chain exercises for an earlier return to sport without an increase in knee laxity, combining eccentric and concentric exercises, combining isokinetic and isotonic exercises, and combining motor control and strength training. When compared to standard care, plyometric and agility exercises may further improve subjective knee function and functional activities without causing any laxity or pain. Cross education, which is the training of the contralateral side to increase the strength on the affected side, is not recommended. The studies appear to be ambiguous. However, it is recommended to strengthen the unaffected side with simply the goal of strengthening it. Now let's talk about returning to some activity. The guideline group recommends not attempting to drive until at least four to six weeks and when the brakes can be pushed quickly in a simulated emergency. This is for right-sided ACL reconstruction. For a left reconstruction, this can be as early as two to three weeks. What about running? The experts know that there are no clear evidence-based criteria. However, they do propose some because it's an important part of rehab. 
Here's a list of the criteria. Range of motion is thought to be an important part as well as strength and reactive strength, which is no surprise. Now what about returning to sport? And that's where it gets a bit more challenging. Let's dive in. Returning to sport requires no pain or swelling, full range of motion and a stable knee with tests like the pivot shift. Knee function and psychological readiness should be subjectively assessed with questionnaires like the IKDC and the ACL RSI. Strength criteria are a bit more demanding as well. For a return to high demanding pivoting sports, isokinetic quadriceps and hamstring peak torque at 60 degrees per second should exhibit 100% symmetry. If possible, restore the preoperative absolute values as a minimum if available. And if not available, normative values should do. Counter movement jumps and drop jumps should have at least 90% symmetry in height and concentric eccentric impulse. In terms of the reactive strength index, you'll need a minimum of 1.3 for bilateral jumps and 0.5 for single leg jumps. But what is this? It's the jump height divided by the ground contact time. For bilateral jumps, the height to usually jump off of is 30 centimeters and for single leg, 20. Looking at biomechanics, the sagittal and frontal planes at the hip, knee and ankle should be normalized. And values for moments, angles and work should be symmetrical. For running, we need at least 90% symmetry of vertical ground reaction forces and knee biomechanics during stance in high speed running and change of direction. And finally, the patient should have completed a sport specific program. You probably noticed that rehab should be criteria rather than time-based. The rehabilitation can stop when the patient is able to return to the pre-injury activity level safely. This, of course, is tested with at least the criteria previously mentioned. As you can tell, it all gets quite complicated and that's why we have made the only ACL course you'll ever need together with Bardingen. If you are interested in more sport-specific courses by one of the authors of this guideline, you can check out the Big 3 course. This covers advanced rehab of quad, hamstring and calf muscle tendon injuries. Are you more interested in the hip and groin? We have a course on that too with one of the authors. The links are in the video description. I am Max for PhysioTutors and I will see you in another video. Bye.